This week on the agenda, the AUKUS question. Is it simply a multi-billion dollar military trade bonanza or a devastating blow to the nuclear stability of the world? AUKUS is a trilateral security pact between Australia, the UK and the United States, focusing on military capability and technology, including cyber, AI, hypersonic and electromagnetic warfare. The new AUKUS deal will provide Australia with a fleet of up to eight nuclear-powered submarines and could cost Australia up to $368 billion between now and the mid-2050s. It's a four-phase plan. The first is about training. Australian military and civilian personnel will be embedded with US and UK navies. From 2027, the US and UK will rotate their nuclear-powered submarines through the HMAS Stirling base near Perth in Western Australia. Phase three is about sales. From the early 2030s, if Congress approves, the US could sell Australia three Virginia-class submarines with an option for two more. Then a new submarine, SSN AUKUS, will be developed with UK design and US technology as a future attack submarine for both the UK and Australia. The Australian government says the program will create 20,000 jobs over the next 30 years. But does it contradict the 1968 Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty? This would be the first time a provision in the pact has been used to transfer fissile material and nuclear technology from a nuclear weapon state, the US and the UK, to a non-weapon state, Australia. Some arms control experts worry other nations could follow suit as a way of acquiring and hiding from international monitoring the enriched uranium or plutonium necessary for a nuclear weapon. US President Joe Biden has stressed repeatedly that the submarines in the AUKUS deal will be nuclear powered, not nuclear armed. But many countries, including China, Indonesia and Malaysia, have major concerns about AUKUS's risk to nuclear non-proliferation and its impact on peace and stability in the region. Joining me now are George Yeo, former Foreign Minister of Singapore, and Peter Kuznick, Professor of History and Director of the Nuclear Studies Institute at American University in Washington, D.C. Thanks, both of you, um, for joining us. Um, Peter, I'll, I'll start with you. Um, the AUKUS agreement is ambitious. It's expensive. How risky is it? It's incredibly expensive. We're talking about 250 billion dollars, U.S. dollars, uh, over a long period of time. If you think about the size of this, the, it's 700 percent as much as Australia's defense budget for this fiscal year, 700 percent. It's twice as much as Australia's annual health care budget. So the question is, why is Australia spending such a vast amount of money uh, for something that is of dubious merit to begin with. What it does is it remilitarizes or intensifies the militarization that's going on in the Pacific, and it's very much a part of the U.S. pivot to Asia, but we're moving more and more toward a new Cold War and a calcification of these two blocks right now. So uh, it's very expensive and very, very risky because of the implications that it has for the, well, for the global population right now. George, what's your take on AUKUS and the deal as it stands? Well, Singapore has strong uh, defence links with Australia. Uh, we train there. We have a flying training school near Perth. So we, we are not unhappy that Australia is strengthening its defence capability. Uh, and we know that this deal will tie Australia for decades uh, to the U.S. in defense cooperation. Um, so at one level, we are not uncomfortable uh, with the arrangement. But at another level, the rhetoric is very redolent of the Cold War. It's almost as if a ghost from the past is once again haunting the corridors. 
And that's a little unsettling. Plus the fact that we're talking about nuclear power submarines. A ghost from the past rattling the corridors. I mean, that really does um, conjure up um, qu quite a, a few emotions. I, I'm, and Peter, the, the IAEA ha has said, aside from those political ramifications, the deal involves some serious legal and technical matters. Well, what exactly do you think that means? Well, the IAEA and the world is concerned about this idea of spreading nuclear technology. Uh, these submarines use highly enriched uranium. Uh, the, uh, China and France have nuclear submarines that use low enriched uranium. Russia and India have nuclear submarines that use highly enriched uranium, but below weapons grade. These submarines are going to use weapons grade highly enriched uranium. Uh, th it's going to be tightly monitored, but there's, they're exploiting a loophole in the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Article 14 says that this kind of technology can be shared and spread as low for non-explosive purposes. That's a technical uh, distinction, and many people are very concerned. And the United States in the past has been adamant about this uh, disallowing this kind of use of technology. So there is a real risk not so much for Australia. There are very tight safeguards in place from the IAEA on this, on this deal. But Australia is not the end of it. If Australia can get this, why can't Iran? Iran's been wanting this. Why can't South Korea? Why can, I mean, other countries, Japan, have the capability of getting this kind of technology. Uh, and so there is definitely a risk uh, that the IAEA is very aware of and has been trying to address. But George, I'm thinking about what President Biden was saying about how these submarines are going to be nuclear powered, not nuclear armed. Do you think, though, there is then the prospect of acquiring nuclear weapons in the future? Well, you will certainly make it easier. But I, I believe the Australian government, when it says that Australia has no desire to be a nuclear uh, to have nuclear weapons uh, in the country uh, i agree with peter that what worries us the most is the fact that it sets a dangerous precedent because while we may uh, have trust in australia there are any number of other countries whom we would be very wary about them having uh, such uh, fissile material uh, in, in their ships so, so it is concerning and and it's important to have uh, safeguards in place and be mindful of the precedent that's being set. Do you think that's what the uh, former Australian Prime Minister Paul Keating meant, um, Peter, when he said that this was the worst deal ever and serves no military purpose? I mean, do, do you think he has a point? Well, Keating said a lot that was very interesting. He said that the United States, as George said earlier, is effectively creating a new Cold War, that the United States is threatened by the fact that China is, is challenging American primacy in the region. He said this is the worst deal that Australia has ever done. It's a waste that Australia's current kind of uh, submarines can defend it against China or anybody else that was going to attack Australia. The difference here, he said, is that this is an offensive weapon. That uh, is not the defensive weapon that Australia has had in the past, but this is in order to attack China, not to defend against China. And so uh, he's been quite concerned and alarmist, but uh, other uh, Australian officials have also been condemning this. Uh, Malcolm Turnbull and others have also been quite critical. And concerns have been voiced um, from, from states, other states around the world, notably China, notably Indonesia and Malaysia. Um, China, a nuclear weapon state, has nuclear non-proliferation concerns at the centre of its international campaign against AUKUS. Um, so, George, I'm wondering how much resonance do you think that will have in Southeast Asia and the Pacific? Well, in, in Southeast Asia, we know that there's a big game going on between the US and China, which we really don't want to be party to. And we, we much prefer the region not to get involved in this, uh, what could become a titanic struggle. 
one scenario which the Chinese must worry about is that uh, Australian submarines will be involved uh, in the South China Sea, uh, hunting down Chinese strategic submarines, which is China's only assured counter-strike capability right now. China has a few hundred warheads against many thousands in the US, and it feels that it must have enough warheads to threaten the US so that it cannot be threatened by the US. So if China feels strongly that this is a move against the strategic submarines in the South China Sea, then I think it will uh, significantly increase the number of warheads it has, including warheads on land. So that even if in the first track capability, the US is able to destroy 95% of China's warheads, at least a few dozen will get through to threaten the US in return. So this is, uh, this is I mean, it's, it's astonishing that in the 21st century, we are thinking in those terms. And from the Chinese viewpoint, this surely must be one of the scenarios envisaged by AUKUS. And it must trouble them, and it must lead to a response. And I think for Australia, this will drag them into uh, scenarios where China becomes an enemy and where they in turn must expect China to plan uh, scenarios where Australia is an enemy. So there are huge consequences that derive from AUKUS. And this is, plays into what we were, we were saying before uh, about the AUKUS partners being accused of exploiting a loophole in the nuclear non-proliferation um, agreements. Do you think, um, Peter, now that that loophole might be closed? No, I'm afraid that it's going to be open wider than ever. You have to remember back in the 1980s when Canada wanted to work with Britain and France to develop nuclear submarines. It was the United States that blocked that on the grounds that this could lead to nuclear proliferation and open the door to other countries doing the same thing. I'm afraid that, that this is sending the exact wrong message and now other countries will be looking to do it. And, and Australia might be you know, totally above board. There are a lot of uh, safeguards in place to, to make any kind of proliferation very, very difficult. However, uh, that doesn't mean that other countries are going to be quite as stringent and, and scrupulous in this regard. So, uh, I mean, it, it's very worrying. It sets the wrong, the wrong message goes against what the United States has been saying for many, many years. And in terms of sending a message, you know, when this AUKUS organization was set up in September 2021, it really caught Southeast Asia by surprise. Now we've got these details, George, of the, of the four-phase pact. I mean, is the deal that, is it something that Southeast Asia can live with or could it maybe exacerbate conflict and tensions in the region? I don't think we're happy about it uh, because of uh, what it means in terms of nuclear proliferation. Uh, but we know there's nothing we can do about it. Uh, the move has been made. I don't think it's reversible. In a sense, it, it was something we always knew, that there is a bedrock relationship between Australia and the US. Uh, what we hope is that uh, in actual policy, above that bedrock, Australia will remain autonomous and be seen as autonomous and not just being an ally of the US. I think that's good uh, for the region, that's good for Australia. I think that's also good for the US, for Australia to play a more autonomous role. Now that a bedrock position has been laid. But there is a balance to be struck here, um, isn't there, for Australia, um, Peter, between the, the intentions of the AUKUS deal, the technological requirements that are going to co come from them, and, and those regional concerns? Uh, Australia has thrown in its lot with the, the US and Britain at this point. I don't see the balance right now. Uh, even even before this goes into effect, because we're not going to be delivering these submarines until the early 2040s at the, at the at the best. So we're talking about something a two decade program, but in the short run, Australia is going to be is uh, Australians will be embedded in the U.S. and the British nuclear submarine programs. 
British and American nuclear subs are going to be rotating through Perth much more frequently. I mean, there's a, an interoperability and an integration that's going on that's making uh, Australia very much uh, an, a close ally of the U.S. and Britain in their attempt to contain China. I mean, they're even talking about NATO focusing on China now. We've got this division going on that's very, very counterproductive and, and quite dangerous uh, as the world is getting more militarized. And so to see Australia following the footsteps, Japan is doubling its defense spending. Uh, the Philippines just offered the U.S., what was it, four more military bases. We've got these joint uh, uh, military drills going on across Asia now. Uh, and so war games and other preparations, it's become a, a much more dangerous situation now. And, and this is a, an important addition to that, pushing it again in, in that direction of a new Cold War. Gentlemen, let's pause there uh, for a moment. But still to come here on the agenda, we'll look in more detail into what AUKUS really says about today's geopolitical fault lines. We can try out the wild and crazy idea. Nothing can stop an idea whose time is coming. This idea is coming. I actually feel quite comfortable in isolation. We should all be very basic when we're trying to save the world. Awesome. We hope it will happen. We have to live in hope. Welcome back to the agenda. Let's continue now with our discussion about the controversial AUKUS deal and what impact it might have on future geopolitics. Still with me are Giorgio, former foreign minister of Singapore, and Peter Kuznick, professor of history and director of the Nuclear Studies Institute at American University in Washington, DC. George, what do you think this um, global row says about geopolitical relations, notably between China and the United States? It's not good because uh, the U.S. feels very threatened by China's rise and, and worries that its dominance in the world uh, is being somehow diminished or diluted by China's rise. It's not that China threatens the U.S. militarily, but China threatens U.S. dominance in the world. I think it's inevitable that the world will become multipolar. And it's better to manage multipolarity and somehow find a way to, to think afresh about how we can live together in this world rather than going back to the old thinking of threatening each other with Armageddon. Uh, you would have thought that we have gone beyond such thinking, but somehow maybe we have fallen. Um, this is... This is be, be honest, I mean, Singapore is a small country. In Southeast Asia, we are price takers. Uh, Singapore supports interoperability. We have our links with Australia, New Zealand, the UK, through the five power defense arrangements. We operate with the US. And in fact, we allow US ships and aeroplanes to use facilities in Singapore. But that does not mean that we support current US policy vis a vis China. I mean, we support stability. We support. Uh, sea lanes and, and air, airways being kept open. We support international trade. And most of all, we support a world where, where the US may, be, may still be primus inter Paris. We support a world where there's mutual respect for one another and one where, um, where we are not caught up in zero-sum games, you know, where, where we think creatively. How can we work together? How can we benefit our people together? rather than always think that what you gain is what I lose. So we're looking at a, a new multipolar world. Um, but I, I still wonder, Peter, if you feel that enough has been done here to allay concerns about nuclear non-proliferation and adventurism. Uh, no, I mean, the world, as George says, is going the wrong direction. All nine nuclear powers are modernizing their nuclear forces. We've got several countries 
that are actually expanding their nuclear arsenals. So they're all trying to make their more efficient and more lethal uh, and also more usable. Uh, and they're, you look at Biden's advisors, he's got 18 top advisors from the Center for a New American Security. These are all the China hawks. These were the people who, during the Obama administration, were behind the Asia pivot that Hillary Clinton announced in late 2011. And now they're calling the shots, really, for the Biden administration. We hoped that when Biden took over from Trump, he was going to dial some of this back. But he hasn't. He's doubled down on what Trump was doing and made it even uh, more of a confrontation between the United States and China. Uh, clearly, our friends in Singapore don't want that, and much of the world doesn't want that. What does it mean for global organizations that are promoting cooperation, collaboration, partnership, um, inclusivity, like, for example, ASEAN? Is that, George, even still relevant? Uh, it is. ASEAN is very relevant and, cert and certainly very important to Singapore. If ASEAN stays cohesive, we will not be balkanized and we will be a region which all the major powers will see advantage in continuing to have as a convening platform. So if you think back, ASEAN is where America meets North Korea, where everyone sits around the table, even though they may not like each other. That's ASEAN's magic. If you look at the way President Jokowi uh, conducted the G20 meeting in Bali, I thought it was brilliant. He did it not by interposing himself, not by strong leadership, but by creating an ambiance where people were forced to be on good behavior with one another and where dem dem diplomacy was allowed to work its magic. This is the ASEAN way. So we must never lose hope in international organizations. And I view with some fascination uh, China's initiative on Ukraine. A bit unexpected, uh, a little vague right now, but at least China is opening up a space which can widen in the future and which all the protagonists may need. Right now, they're giving war a chance, all of them. But how long more? In a, few, a year, two years? Sooner or later, some ceasefire must be agreed to. And this is where the little space which China is now opening may well become extremely important. And it's interesting how you talk about um, countries and world leaders needing to be on their best behaviour in certain environments. Peter, I, I wonder what, what you think about George was just saying there about the, the opportunities um, and the potential um, that, that, that China is pushing for. Uh, I agree with George 100 percent on this. Uh, China's initiative on Ukraine, as George said, is somewhat vague on the details, but the overall thrust is correct. And as China is not isolated in that way. It's not just China. The Pope has called for diplomacy. Lula recently said that we need a peace G20 like the economic G20, that it should be led by India and China and Indonesia and other countries. Uh, and, and China's diplomacy recently has been very uh, productive. We saw the deal between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Nobody saw that coming. Uh, but it's the, the right step. We've got to be sitting down and talking. Uh, and if we sit down and talk, we can come up with solutions. The situation with Ukraine is a catastrophe for all of humanity right now, not just for the Ukrainians, not just for the Russians, but the th that raises again the threat of nuclear war that we've been talking about. Uh, and uh, we need to sit down and, and figure out how to resolve. We need a new global security architecture. With China's point one in their 12-point peace proposal was to call for, to defend sovereignty, which is effectively a criticism of Russia for infringing on Ukrainian sovereignty. But his point, too, was that every country deserves security, and nobody's security should be achieved at the expense of another country's security. And he talked about the dangers of military blocks. And that was a critique of NATO and uh, the United States and implicitly Ukraine. So China's trying to be uh, a broker in, in this situation, and all such efforts 
are welcome, and hopefully they won't take a year or two, but uh, would, would bear, bear fruit much more quickly. But as you say, all of this is taking place against a complicated and, and, and a, a tricky um, geopolitical and economic uh, background. And that whole military um, architecture, um, as you put it, um, is shifting and changing. So much is at stake, uh, particularly when it comes to AUKUS. And I'm wondering, um, George, if you think that AUKUS will survive the electoral cycle. Well, uh, AUKUS was initiated by the Liberal government and is now uh, put into force or initial uh, implementation by, by a Labour government. So I think it enjoys bipartisan support. And in Aust among the Australian people, there's a deep instinct that the long-term future depends on the very tight strategic relationship with the US. I've told the Chinese before at the National Defence University that they must have no illusion about Australia's relationship with the US at the bedrock level. But above that level, there's plenty of room for diplomacy. And what we need now in the world is to have more peacemakers and fewer warmongers. Uh, it, it's so easy to, to throw stones, but making peace is hard work. And I think if more of us speak up in favor of peace, when Zelensky wants to speak to Xi Jinping, and I hope they will speak, let us all chime in to say, look, this is a good thing. It appears very difficult now, but little by little, with enough goodwill, new possibilities may creatively emerge. And this is what we must work towards, work for, pray for. Peter, what do you think the lasting impact of AUKUS is going to be? We don't know, really, what the lasting impact, because certain parts of it come into play pretty quickly over the next few years. Other parts are much more long term. You know, look at how the world has changed in the past 20 years. It's going to be another 20 years before these nuclear submarines are actually delivered to Australia. Uh, how different will the world be by then? Hopefully, if it's going to go in, in a direction toward peace and prosperity and cooperation. If it really develops into a new Cold War, uh, we might not even be here in 20 years as a, as a planet or as a human species. Um, so, I, I mean, I don't want to entertain that. But the long, if this does go into effect, uh, then I think the world gets much more dangerous, much more polarized, much more divided and much more militarized. I think we're going the wrong, wrong direction with this kind of arrangement. That's a pretty stark outlook. George, I wonder, do you, do you agree with that outlook? AUKUS is troubling because of nuclear proliferation, because of the precedent that it sets. And others will for sure cite this precedent. And that's not good for the world. AUKUS is not good in the way it rekindles all these haunting tunes from the Cold War. Uh, I think we should move away from that and turn our minds towards how we can accommodate one another, the aspirations of our people, and work towards peaceful win-win outcomes rather than being trapped in zero-sum thinking. Giorgio and Peter Kuznick, thank you both very much indeed. You can watch every episode of The Agenda in full on CGTN Europe's YouTube channel. And for exclusive extra content from me, my guests and the rest of the team, don't forget to check out At The Agenda Show on TikTok. Coming up on a future agenda, powering on why hydrogen could be the green fuel of the future. But for now, from me, Juliet Mann, and from all of the Agenda team here in London, goodbye. <laughs>